Um, uh, and the reason for it is somehow this rigidity of small representations of supersymmetry. Um, okay. Um, so, as a remark, um, if we define, well, let's, yeah, we're in a hurry, so let's just say in our example, this invariant has a, has a well-known meaning, chi of h is just the Euler characteristic of the manifold M. Um, which, of course, is well known not to depend on a Riemannian metric, right? Um, this is uh, one of the simplest topological invariants that you could attach to M, and we recover it by this kind of elaborate uh, uh, talk about supersymmetry algebras. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Here. Oh, sorry. Yeah, of course, what I meant to write, thank you. Yeah, two zero energy states, but sitting in different uh, pieces of the Hilbert space. Um, okay, uh, so let's now talk about, so in the notes you'll find some discussion of uh, a few sort of more non-trivial examples of this structure. Um, but, so in view of the time, I better go on right away to the more interesting structure. So, so let's talk about uh, quantum field theory. Um, so, so up till now I was talking about quantum mechanics, and you can think of quantum mechanics as being kind of one-dimensional quantum field theory. Now let me talk about d-dimensional quantum field theory. So d-dimensional quantum field theory, which I'll just formulate. So in general, you have a d-dimensional quantum field theory. You could imagine trying to formulate it on some general d-dimensional manifold. Um, let me just formulate it in d-dimensional Minkowski space, so r to the d minus 1 comma 1. Um, so then, just as before, we get a Hilbert space. In fact, this is actually an example of the structure we had before. So d-dimensional quantum field theory is an example of quantum mechanics. Um, but it has a lot more structure. Um, so the Hilbert space will come to us now, even before we're talking about supersymmetry, the Hilbert space comes to us as a representation um, of the group of isometries uh, of r to the d minus 1 comma 1. So I'll just talk about part of that. Um, ISO d minus 1 comma 1. So what is that? That's SO d minus 1 comma 1, so the linear transformations, um, plus the translations. And they intertwine together in a semi-direct product. Um, so this is just the rotations, uh, rotations and boosts, so preserving the metric in Minkowski space, um, together with the translations. Um, so, and these generators actually won't talk about too much explicitly, but these generators we'll talk about, so let's give them a name. So the translation generators um, the generators of the Lie algebra here, um, I'll call them P0 for the translation in the zero direction. Um, that's the time-like direction. Sometimes we also call that H, the Hamiltonian. Um, and then P1 up to PD for the translations in the other directions. Uh, PD minus one, sorry. So D is the dimension of space-time. Um, uh, so the case we talked about before, if you like, was the case of ISO zero comma one, where this group was trivial, um, and R, this was just R to the one with the single generator H. Um, Okay, so now we're doing some jazzed up version of that. Um, okay. 
So let's ask now, what kind of representations of this group are we gonna find? What kind of unitary representations of this group are we gonna find? Uh, And, and now we're getting into the world where, so in quantum mechanics, you can easily write down, you know, explicitly uh, examples of Hilbert spaces. In non-trivial quantum field theories, it's already quite hard, um, and I certainly won't try to do it here, to write down explicit examples of these representations. So all I'm gonna do is tell you some sort of formal properties of the representation that'll be enough to get us going. Um, uh, okay, so let's just think about how we would organize a representation of this group. Um, Um, okay, so before I was organizing them in terms of diagonalizing the uh, Hamiltonian, um, that was great because the Hamiltonian was, was central. Um, now the Hamiltonian is not central anymore, right? Um, so I'm not gonna try to organize things by diagonalizing that. Instead, what I gotta do is find something central. There's a Casimir operator. Um, so an operator in the universal enveloping algebra. Um, uh, which is take P0 squared minus P1 squared minus up to P to D minus one squared. So, you know, essentially because the inner product in Minkowski space is invariant under this group, this operator, um, this operator in the universal enveloping algebra over Lie algebra um, will be in the center. So that's a Casimir operator. So it acts as a scalar in every, um, uh, irreducible representation, so we can use that to try to organize the representations. Um, so let me call that, we could call it rho, it will be convenient actually to call it m squared. So we're only gonna consider representations where uh, this guy acts as a positive number, so I'm, I'm gonna call it m squared. Um, uh, okay, now, so here's a fact about the representation theory of this group. Um, so for any constant m greater than zero, um, and any, um, uh, you know, finite dimensional, well, for any irreducible representation of the group spin d minus one, that's the double cover universal cover of SO D minus one. There exists an irreducible representation, a unitary irreducible representation unitary irreducible representation uh, V M comma S of my group uh, Um, so I'm saying, what's the data that I have to give you to, to choose a representation? Before, the data that I was giving was just the value of the energy. Um, now the data that I'm giving is two, two things. One, a, a positive real number, and the second thing is a representation of uh, this group, spin d minus one. Um, so how should you think about this representation? Uh, well, so first of all, so how you should think of it physically is you should think of it as the representation that represents states of one particle. And that particle is supposed to have mass, rest mass m, and its spin. So in general, spin is given by a representation exactly of this group, the rotations of space, which in this case is gonna be, well, SO d minus one or spin d minus one. Um, so that's how you're supposed to think about this representation. So in the Hilbert space, there's gonna be a bunch of different representations that represent states that just have one particle. Yeah, so maybe already I should draw uh, a little picture of what the Hilbert space is gonna look like. I'll come back in a second and tell you a little bit about how to construct this representation. Um, but maybe I should first draw the picture of what the Hilbert space is gonna look like. 
So um, in, in a quantum field theory with a mass gap, which for a minute is all I'll consider, uh, what the Hilbert space is going to look like So now I'm going to organize it according to this, uh, this invariant m, um, which for one particle states you think of as the mass of the particle. Um, uh, and so the picture is going to be at mass zero, there's the vacuum. Um, then there's going to be a bunch of states that occur discreetly. So these are the one particle, I'll call them one particle representations. So each of them is going to be isomorphic to some uh, VMS. So this is telling you roughly the various kinds of particles that exist in the theory. So there's one particle with mass, say, M1, one particle with mass M2, one particle with mass M3, and all have different spins. Um, they're given by these representations S. Um, and then at some point, uh, there's going to set in, there's going to be a continuum starting at 2m1. And this part comes from the multi-particle states. So roughly the picture is, if I have a, if I have a multi-particle state, um, then those two states, think of it as being literally just two particles. Think of it just a naive classical picture. You literally have two particles. Those two particles can have any kind of relative momentum to each other. Um, and depending on what the relative momentum is, the eigenvalue of this Casimir operator changes. The least it could be is 2m1 if they're sitting at rest. Um, so if you have two particles that both have mass m1 and they're sitting at rest, then you get a state where the Casimir is just two times m1. Um, but they can also have relative energy. Uh, they, can, they can be you know, moving relative to one another. And so you actually get a, a continuum above 2m1. Um, so the picture of the Hilbert space is going to be like this. We're going to be trying to study these one particle representations and avoiding this continuum. Um, OK. So, so that's the picture of what the Hilbert space looks like. Um, let's just say a word about how, this re how these uh, representations are constructed. Um, um, so, so actually the easiest way to understand uh, the construction is to first imagine you had this representation. So suppose you have this representation and let's look inside of it. Um, at just the states, the states at rest. So inside of this representation, we can look at all the states um, such that P0 just acts as M, and all the PIs act as 0. Uh, sorry, yep. P0 acts with eigenvalue M, all the PIs act as 0 um, uh, for I. Uh, not equal to zero. So, no, that's what mass gap means. Mass gap means that uh, um, there's a gap between the vacuum and the first uh, and the first uh, excited state. Yeah, that's right. Having a mass gap means it doesn't have any massless particles. Ah, right, right. Great question. So Yang Mills theory is supposed to have uh, um, is supposed to have a mass gap. On the other hand, Yang Mills theory, as, as it's formulated in the Lagrangian framework, seems to have gluons, which are massless, right? Yeah, so the point is um, that, that Lagrangian, how can I say? The, the sort of high energy description of the theory um, is indeed it, in, terms of, in, terms of, uh, in terms of massless particles. They're not asymptotic states. So <laughs> maybe the easiest way to say it is that the theory, if you look at it in Lagrangian, it looks like it has, uh, it has massless particles. The actual theory does not have massless particles. Um, so when you actually solve for the, what the infrared physics is, it's not, it's, it's not a trivial thing, but that theory, in fact, actually does not have massless particles. Um, uh, 
Okay, so yeah, so here um, I want to understand what is this representation uh, VMS, particles with mass M and spin S. Um, and so the way I understand it is to look at the subspace inside of the representation um, consisting of particles which are at rest, so they have momentum, if you like, this is like saying the momentum of the particle is M zero, 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 zero. So we look, we look at this subspace. That subspace um, is a representation just of the group G rest, um, which is spin D minus one uh, plus the translations uh, R to the D. Um, so this whole representation is going to be very infinite dimensional because it describes, it has states corresponding to particles with every possible momentum. Um, uh, on the other hand, when you look at this particular subspace, this is going to be a nice finite dimensional space, which is a representation of this group uh, G rest. And so the picture is that um, so this V rest M comma S is just isomorphic to S as a representation of spin D minus one. Um, and what you can actually do, so you can actually build the representation essentially in reverse. So you can build the representation, the whole VMS, Uh, as a representation of G uh, by this procedure called induction, starting from V rest as a representation of G rest. Um, so, Um, so the moral of the story is that um, this representation, it looks like a big complicated representation because um, it contains states of all possible momenta, um, but everything is actually determined just by a nice finite dimensional subspace, which is the space of states at rest. Um, so in order to understand uh, the unitary representations that appear in this quantum field theory, it really boils down to the representation theory of this nice, uh, um, this relatively nice group, a compact group times translations. Um, okay, so now, in the last few minutes, I want to describe for you, as much as I can, the supersymmetric extension of this. Um, so, So let's talk now about supersymmetric quantum field theory. Uh, so now, as before, we're going to have a Hilbert space, um, which is graded and which is acted on by a Lie superalgebra. Um, and now the idea is that this is extending. So before, we just took the Hamiltonian and threw in some odd generators. Now we're going to take the whole uh, ISO d minus 1 comma 1 and throw in some odd generators on top of that. And we're going to study the representation theory now of that superalgebra. Um, so, so this is a thing where it's now very hard to say anything uniform. So it really depends in detail on which exact dimension and which exact supersymmetry algebra you study. Um, so let's just talk about one example, which is the example I'm going to, uh, it's going to be relevant for the next lecture. Um, which is n equals two comma two supersymmetry in two dimensions. Um, and so here, let me just write out the algebra that's relevant. Do I have about five minutes, is that right? All right. So we'll do a kind of condensed treatment. Um, so, so let me tell you what the superalgebra is. 
So I'll just give you like a list of its generators. Um, so for A0, the even part, um, we have the generators of SO11, uh, the rotation and boosts. Um, well, just boosts in this case. Um, then we have the translations. And so P0, I'll call H as usual. And in this case, we just have one other translation. We just have one new space dimension, um, one space dimension. So I just call that one P. Um, and then we're going to have two new generators that I'll call Z and Z bar. Those are called the central charges. Um, so we're extending, we're actually, in this case, we're actually extending even the even part a little bit. Um, and then in the odd part, we're going to have just four odd generators, Q plus, Q bar plus, Q minus, and Q bar minus. So before I had two Qs, I just had two Q and Q bar. In this example, we have four Qs. Um, uh, and I'll just write what are the brackets um, the brackets of the Qs come out to be like this. So Q plus with Q bar plus is P plus. So before it was just the Qs bracket to the Hamiltonian. Now there's a more interesting. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, I'll say anything. Yeah, thanks. So P plus minus is H plus or minus P. So they're kind of the light cone translations. Um, but explicitly, it's H plus or minus P. Um, uh, um, okay, I gotta go to the next board, I guess, for the rest. So now, um, the bracket of Q plus with Q minus um, is Z, and the bracket of uh, Q bar plus with Q bar minus is Z bar. Um, so here, the bracket of some odd generators gives us translations. The bracket of other odd generators gives us these new uh, elements, uh, Z and Z bar. Um, and Z and Z bar, I should say, are central. So they commute with everybody. Um, uh, OK. Um, so now, I think I'll just tell you what's the kind of basic fact about the representation theory of this algebra. Um, by analogy with what I told you uh, in the non-supersymmetric case. Um, so, so now, for any m that's a real number, um, and z a complex number, um, and obeying an inequality, that the mass is greater than or equal to the absolute value of the central charge. Um, then there's going to be two irreducible representations, um, V i m comma z of a. And so, how do we think of it? No, no, no. Z is z bar is a complex conjugate of z. It's a, it, my convention, it, I'm talking about a unitary representation. Um, a unitary representation, Z bar, will act as the complex conjugate of Z. Some people might have said there's one complex generator called Z. Um, uh, um, so, uh, so, so the name of these irreducible representations is they're one particle states one particle representation where the particle has mass m. And, and now it has this funny new invariant, which didn't occur in, in non-supersymmetric theories. So in non-supersymmetric theories, we had the mass and the spin. Now we're going to have this, this other number. The central charge. Um, and these representations come again in two kinds. Uh, uh, I'll call them short 
uh, if the mass is exactly equal to the absolute value of the central charge, and long if the mass is strictly greater than the absolute value of the central charge. Um, so this, we don't have time to do it, although it's in the notes. Um, this bound comes from a kind of Hodge theory kind of argument, much like what we did for the, for the superparticle, right? Um, the fact that the Hamiltonian was the bracket of two Qs meant that the energy had to be non-negative and that something special happens when that bound is saturated. Here, we have the exact same kind of situation. Um, uh, you do a kind of Hodge theory thing, which is in the notes, um, and you get that the representation, first of all, M is bounded below, not by zero, but by central charge. And the representation is smaller if the mass is equal to the absolute value of the central charge. So I'll just say one other thing and then stop. Sorry. Um, so as before, um, uh, the representations VI, uh, the mass is absolute value of Z, and Z, these representations are rigid. 